Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Village Global's Venture Stories. I'm here today with a very special guest, Portfolio CEO, Liron Shapira of Relationship Hero. Liron, welcome to the podcast. Hey, my pleasure. I listened to all the episodes. So it's cool to be on it. Uh, I'm glad to hear. Uh, so, so Liron, um, by way of introduction, why don't you talk about what is Relationship Hero and what inspired you to start it? Sure, yeah. So Relationship Hero is uh, the startup I've been working on since 2017. Uh, we started in Y Combinator, summer 2017. The reason I started it is because I was looking around for a, a problem to work on. You know, as I love startups and I'm like, what problem do I actually know a lot about? And in my case, I had too much of a charmed life. I didn't really have that many life problems, but I had a pretty terrible dating life. Like I'd be really awkward on dates. I wouldn't know how to use dating apps. I get really frustrated. Like they give me a blank white screen. I'm like, there, what are the rules to this game? You know, you can't win this game. So I'd always be struggling with my dating and I'd hit up my friend Lior, who's now my co-founder. And I'd ask him a million questions and he would be basically my personal dating and relationship coach. He would be like coaching me on exactly what to write and how to interpret the other person's text and how to plan a date. Um, and so when I was thinking about what problem do I actually know about to start a company around, I'm like, what if we could package up what my co-founder was giving me? Because that's actually the one place where I needed a ton of help and I was getting a ton of value. So that was the initial spark for relationship era. That, that's awesome. And, and, and talk about how the, the product has evolved since, since, since 2017 and, and based on what, you, what you've learned about how people use it. Yeah, sure. So um, when it started, it was uh, basically a, a chat room where people could upload their uh, screenshots, similar of how I would do with my friends. Like, hey, here's a screenshot that I got from OkCupid okay and we're having this conversation, but now I'm getting flaked on or I don't know what to say. Um, and then we would give them coaching. We started doing it for free just as a minimum viable product. Um, and then we're like, okay, let's charge people for it. Let's get more serious about making this a business. Let's let them purchase credits. You know, so we slowly started layering on all these features. And then we said, okay, can we scale it to somebody else being the coach besides uh, my co-founder? So we really just took it one step at a time, right? And every time we're trying to just validate a little bit more, bring a few more people in, make a little bit more money. And then finally, we, it started getting more serious. And it's like, okay, what do the unit economics look like? What's customer acquisition? So basically, we took it one step at a time. So what you guys are sort of doing is you're you're creating a new category, right? Relationship coach, sort of relationship coaches at scale. T talk a bit about that and, and what you've learned about w what that category is. Sure, yeah. So we have always believed this is a huge category, uh, relationship coaching. It's actually very interesting if you look at the market. At this point, everybody knows therapy is a huge market. Um, you have uh, BetterHelp, which is like a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, Talkspace is actually doing a SPAC valued at uh, a couple billion and, you know, it's about it's about a seven billion dollar market, just therapy. And then you've got, uh, you know, dating app, you know, the match group is the juggernaut there. So you've got these huge markets and then you've got relationship coaching, which is people who help you with your relationships, uh, give you practical advice on what to text. Should you get into a relationship? Uh, how do you communicate? So this whole space, basically this thing that everybody's talking with their friends about uh, is like a non-existent space. So relationship hero is actually number one in the relationship coaching space. There's no other relationship coaching brand. And so our whole thesis is like, well, this should be a $10 billion space. I mean, look at how everybody in their life is always hitting up their friends and getting very questionable relationship advice. Uh, so that was our initial thesis. And so far, we have validated like less than 1% of that in terms of how much we've grown. We've grown to like a few million dollars a year of revenue. So we think we're just scratching the surface, but it's good initial validation. Yeah. What types of archetypes make great relationship coaching? And then I want to ask, like, how, how do you train them? Sure. So there's not a, a super... Uh, fixed archetype. And that's part of our arbitrage is we don't just go, we're not a marketplace. So we don't just tap into an existing pool of people who have an existing certification. We have to kind of mix and match like, oh, okay, you have a psychology degree. Okay. Are you familiar with these subjects? Uh, we have a, a very elaborate interview that's entirely skills-based. So you put them through like simulated coaching, a bunch of written questions. We actually do 160 hours of training that uh, we don't charge them for. Uh, before we're, we're ready to say, okay, you can be a relationship coach on our platform. And then we keep monitoring and training them even past that point. So our model is very much like a, a you might call it a managed marketplace, but we think about it as uh, we're kind of, we're not just creating the relationship coaching industry. We're also creating the relationship coaching certification. We're even creating the relationship coaching field of study, basically, right? Like in college, you can't really get a degree in relationship coaching. 
And yet, you know, why not, right? Like human courtship, like it totally should be a subject. Um, and so, yeah, it's a lot of our secret sauce is, you know, defining what a relationship coach is and which combination of factors makes them good. Totally. It, sh- share some some learnings about about dating and relationships that you, you've learned from, from, from running Relationship Hero and having all this uh, data and insight. Definitely, yeah. So one is just the, the, the breadth and uh, like the shared human experience of all these different problems, right? So we're actually an international service. So we just get people in every country you can imagine, as, as long as they're English speaking, and they're coming in with very similar problems. And sure, sometimes there's cultural differences, you know, like we've coached some people in Saudi Arabia, and obviously, like the LGBT coaching we do is a little different, given all the pressures there. But just like the, the, the swath of our market, like you can't really draw a circle around who's coming in to use Relationship Hero, besides like, okay, 18 and up, it's a uh, half male, half female, um, it's every possible demographic. And, and it's kind of the validation of the initial thesis of like, I personally, Liron, I'm not the only guy in the world who has like major or has had in the past major struggles uh, with these dating issues. Like people struggle with that and much more. And we've segmented it down into about 50 different subcategories and we keep growing. So you have like, okay, issues when your spouse is in the military or issues when your spouse is on the uh, ASD spectrum or like recovering from cheating or uh, the whole spectrum of breakups. Like getting back together when you broke up 10 years ago, but now you just got a text. Um, so we've, it's so even this thing that we call relationship coaching, not only is it a big market, but it has like 50 pretty big markets within it. No, it's fascinating. And so if we're imagining, you know, five years from now you, or, or sooner or later, you guys have created this sort of field of study and it, you know, it just like in any field of study, right there, you know, in economics, there's like Keynesian economics, there's, you know, Friedman economics, different schools of thought. If, if you were to imagine, you know, once this becomes a, you know, really legitimate sort of academic field, what different schools of thought could emerge, what, what, what comes to mind? Yeah, so there are some variations in like styles. So one of the styles we do is uh, very tactical focused. So, and that's that's the one that I'm the most familiar with. So like, I've basically broken down dating into like an algorithm or even like conversation skills. Like, oh, if you're in this stage of the conversation, you should manufacture uh, a, a line that meets this criteria, right? So it's very tactical. Um, but another one is um, it's it's more inwardly focused where it's like, how do you basically calibrate your emotions to be appropriate for the situation you're, you're in? Like, how do you kind of, you know, ride the elephant that is your subconscious, right? To be like properly calibrated. And those kind of clients, uh, they tend to fade into more like, they could be more of like a life coaching experience. It could be like, they could be using Relationship Bureau for like a year as their situation plays out and they like ease into like the new mental state. Yeah, so that's uh, that's one of our key distinctions. Um, you know, it's there's a lot of connections. So like anxiety can play a big role to various degrees. Um, so that brings in like a separate area of study. And then there's also like there's there's a sub school of like narcissism and, and how that factors in. So. So, yeah, I mean, I think we should probably publish like a breakdown. Yeah. And, and there's a lot around just around like gender roles in general, like this whole, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. You know, there was sort of, like my understanding is that this subgroup was pretty controversial, but there was sort of the pickup artist community. Um, that was maybe for like foretellings or foreshadowing, you know, the idea that there would be like a study of courtship. Maybe they will be seen as like the Austrian economist or something, the, the first to, to, to market, so to speak, but, but somewhat discredited or I'm curious how that will be viewed. But, but yeah, it's interesting. There, there, there's just been a lot of like sub niches that have tried to do this, but you guys are really legitimizing it. Yeah. And I got to say about pickup artists because I looked into the pickup community when I was struggling with dating and they're a pretty messed up community. Like they get a lot of things wrong, but they got one thing right, which is just the idea of like, right, let's have a bunch of people getting together and just trying to analyze courtship, right? Let's see what we can do. Because before that, nobody would even touch it. Everybody would just be like, well, love just happens, right? Whoever's right for you, you're going to meet them. So they at least made it okay to be like, well, how do we just break it down and think analytically about it? Now, the actual theories they came up with are like, many of them are terrible. Uh, but, you know, they, but they were on the cutting edge of like actually giving it a shot. Yeah, no, totally. It, it's interesting when someone could identify some like an interesting problem or an interesting way of perspective and their solution is 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 not great but you could still take the the sort of you know method and, and try to you know propose a different solution i, I see that a, a lot Let, let's transition to just more broadly i mean in, in a macro sort of dating perspective it's interesting because you know in the last like decade couple decades it's the first time we sort of have like mass scale data right on OkCupid really revolutionized, you know, uh, that that with their with their initial blogs, and then of course Tinder, and and you guys are, are getting different kind of data. But but we learned a, a lot about like who's attractive to who, you know, sort of like a power law in, in in dating, or just sort of like the inequalities there. W- what has been most interesting to you, if at all, 
um, you know, worth, worth sharing around just sort of like the macro, you know, how we think about dating in society? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of it is uh, what I referenced there about uh, that originally started with the pickup artist of just this idea of like, look, human courtship is a game, right? Just like business is becoming more of a game, right? So before everything would have like more, uh, more rituals to it, right? More pomp and circumstance, or even think about like, you know, VCs and founders, right? You'd have to, you know, like the whole idea of a coffee meeting, like you have to go get a coffee with a VC, like it's literally like dating. And that's, and you can't even, you have to be ambiguous whether you're raising money or not, right? And now it's like, okay, 30 minute Zoom, all right, are you in or out? Right. So it's becoming a little more transactional, but it's, it's just becoming more goal oriented. Right. And there's less pomp and circumstance. And I think we're, we're definitely seeing that with dating, especially with COVID, where it's like, look, this is what I want. This is what you want. Let's skip some of the some of the rituals like we have to um, meet through a friend. And let's also just analyze, you know, what's what's going to optimize my life for the next 20 years? Like, are you the right match? And what's like my best algorithm for interacting with you. So I'm not saying we have to swing the pendulum all the way and become like robots. But I definitely think that society is getting just more analytical in pretty much every subject. And especially like with texting right now, you have like a record of your whole dating interaction. It's like spelled out, you know, a computer can can read a large part of it. It's like an x-ray of your relationship. Um, so that I think is a major trend. Oh. And, and, and one thing that I'm really excited about it, on the relationship coaching side is you can imagine, you know, there's so many people who do this for their friends, as, as you mentioned, your, your friend and co-founder did, who are, you know, maybe right now they're like customer experience or customer service reps. And, you know, they have to deal with sort of complaining customers, but it'd be so much more interesting to them to, you know, hear people complaining about their relationships, right? Right. And, you know, to, so to some degree, we're kind of like the, the ombudsman or the customer service hotline for when your relationship's broken. And frankly, I mean, that's what people are doing to their friends, right? They're, and, and sometimes their friends are kind of like trapped, right? Like their friends are spending like hours per week. And so we should really be marketing to those friends. Like that's really the value add is yeah. getting the friend out of that position. <laughs> totally. Zooming out a bit, like, you know, where do you see relationship here like five to 10 years out? So a, a lot of it is just scaling what we've done. So we think we've got a really nice microcosm. And I basically mentioned, if you look at our, our demographics now, we've helped over 50,000 clients. Um, it's not like we've saturated the market. It's not like we found the world's 50,000 people who want relationship coaching. We basically just found a very random cross section who like saw our Facebook ad. Uh, and so the next thing with us is like, we want to be a serious player. You know, we want to be like a talk space or a better help. You know, these are like very serious companies in the mental health space. Uh, a few million dollars a year, it's, it's not like a serious proof that a market exists. And so our next step is like, uh, can we do the same thing, but just 100x bigger? That, that makes a lot of sense. Let's zoom out. So you, this is the company you've worked on for the last three years. You worked on you know, a number of other companies uh, before, uh, you know, Quick being one of them. L let's talk about VC. You know, we, we both agree it's getting uh, unbundled. Um, how do you see that playing out? Or what does that mean to you? Yeah, sure. So when I look at the VC community, like I mentioned the idea of the coffee meeting, like I just can't help saying there's like a lot of LARPing. Like there's a lot of people who just seem to be like playing a role. And, you know, there's like that account on Twitter like VC brags, you know, like making fun of all the, the posturing and signaling on Twitter. And I think the reason there's so much posturing and signaling is just because the underlying dynamic is actually pretty simple. It's a marketplace, right? You've got money chasing companies to hopefully make more money. And what's interesting to me, the cognitive dissonance with VCs is, is like, on one hand, you hear VCs uh, say they, they love marketplaces and they say stuff like, I believe in the power of marketplaces to reshape outdated industries that leave billions of dollars of value on the table because buyers and sellers lack a matching mechanism, which is fundamentally just an information problem, right? So they love marketplaces. And then on the other hand, when it comes to their industry, they're like, investing is all about access to deals, right? There's like a major contradiction there. Yeah. So how do you see that being uh, dis disrupted or, or, or playing out? So I think that it has been uh, slowly disrupted. It's It's probably like, um, it's a, it's like 50% disrupted already because the, the market is getting more of a market. It's getting more liquid. So the first salvo, the first uh, sledgehammer that really started disrupting fundraising was the safe note. Uh, so I've experienced this myself at Relationship Hero. With a safe note, you don't even have to do the pomp and circumstance of a round, um, right? You don't have to be like, okay, everybody's coming together, we're raising money. It's literally like you find one person, you're like, hey, how much do you think this company is worth? Okay, you want to give us 200K at the valuation? Okay, done. Right. It's a single transaction, which is almost identical to going on Robinhood. Right. How much is a stock worth? Great. One tap. You've got the stock. Right. So, it's, so that was a huge blow. Now, don't be wrong. Safe notes launched a few years later. People are still doing plenty of rounds. They're still raising big funds. But it was a big blow because it, you know, it atomized the round. And then one, two punch. What are we looking at now? Um, you've got atomization of the investor side. So you've got more capital going to smaller individual funds. You, you've got rolling funds. Right. This is a new thing. 
you've got syndicates that people start. It could, the whole syndicate could be like less than a million dollars and it could just be about one investment. So you don't even have to have like an investment firm. You can have, you know, the firm only exists if, or, or like a SPAC is an example of that, right? So everything's just getting atomized, right? So it's kind of slipping down the slippery slope. And at the end of the slippery slope is what you have is Robinhood, right? Just one tap where you trade a price for an asset. Yeah. And, 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 and yeah, it's interesting. I mean, with, with new regulations sort of emerging around just uh, cr- crowdfunding, it'll be really interesting to to see. Is, is there anything else, else before we move on that you'd like to, that you think about as it relates to the, the, the future of, of VC or, or how you th- just see liquidity changing? Totally. Yeah. So I think once you just have that perspective of like, oh, there's always been fundamentally a marketplace, but there's just been a lot of friction and all the LARPing is like a result of the friction. Once you start seeing that perspective on things, you start to realize, okay, long-term deal flow, sure, that's an advantage today. It's not going to be an advantage long-term. Just like in the public market, there's no such thing as a public investor who has a deal flow advantage. That's a meaningless concept. And it's going to become more and more, uh, it's meaningful today, but it's going to become meaningless. I don't know when, but definitely like within a decade, uh, right? Similarly, access deals. Uh, your brand as a VC, right now, it's like, oh, okay, I got Sequoia. That's that's a very meaningful brand. That's going to matter less because they're, you know, like, for example, it doesn't matter that much who invested in Tesla in the public market. It just matters what the valuation is and who got in at what point for what price. Um, and now the extra value add of the investor, you know, it's nice to have extra value add, but it's going to be fully decoupled from the investment. This isn't an original thought for me. You know, Naval's been saying this uh, since his blog like 10 years ago, right? The idea that if an investor is going to give you value add, that's great, but that's a separate transaction. Like them giving you value and getting advisor equity doesn't have to be the same transaction as, as them putting money in the company. Now, sure, it's related if they have like a minimum check size, right? So there, there, there's some, uh, some barrier there, but, but still the, the natural end game is to decouple. Totally. And, and talk about bloated MVP. What was this project and how does it get you to think about product development? Sure. Yeah. So bloatedmvp.com is, uh, is like the, a subject that I find myself talking about a lot because I talk with startup founders a lot, right? I give them advice. I do a little angel investing. And I noticed that like 80% of the time, the conversation just always goes the same way. Now, the 20% of the time it doesn't, it's great. But 80% of the time, the conversation is always me saying like, well, are you really actually creating value or are you just talking about an abstract idea that's not going to work? That's pretty much where the conversation always goes. And so I coined the term bloated MVP to represent the fact that people think that they're working on a, a minimum viable product. They think they're, they think they're working on an MVP. But actually, they're still not. They're bloating it. They're messing it up. And they're wasting uh, years of their life and millions of dollars. And right, sometimes they'll have like 10 people working for two years. Right. So you just wasted 20 person years. And these are like scarce engineer years. Right. So you've wasted these precious IQ points. Um, and so I find myself in a weird position with a bloated MVP because the lean startup came out 10 years ago. Right. Paul Graham was writing about how you have to uh, your startup is just a vehicle for experimenting and validating. You should talk to customers like this is like the most cliche knowledge ever, right? So like, why do I have to write a blog telling people to write, to write a lean MVP? But I'm just observing in practice, like 80% of people are still screwing it up. Um, and so I, I made this analogy to the great filter. It, it starts with looking at the Fermi paradox and like, why does it seem like humans are the only life out there? It must be pretty hard for life to develop in the universe. Uh, and you've got the Drake equation that tries to multiply out how hard it is for life to form on other planets. And the great filter is just the idea of like, Look, there's got to be at least one step in the evolution of, of uh, galactical civilization. There's got to be at least one step that's really, really hard and rare, which explains why we don't see any other civilizations. Now, maybe that step is behind us in history, right? So maybe it's like going from single cell to multicellular organisms. Maybe that was a really hard step. And on Earth, we got really lucky. But now that we're already past it, we're good to go. We're past the Great Filter, right? Or maybe the Great Filter is a step in our future. Like maybe it's like not destroying ourselves, or maybe it's like, we just can't get technology to like go that far into outer space and then our sun's going to explode and then we're done. Right. So we don't know where the great filter is, but like there's got to be some filter that's killed off or, or never started all the other life forms in the visible universe. All right. So that's, that's the idea of the great filter, like for life. So it seems like there's a great filter for startups and the great filter for startups is, did you ever create value for one user? And that really shifts your perspective of how you see all startups, because when you talk to a startup founder, Uh, You can just ask them that question. Hey, did you ever create value for one user? And the reality is that uh, 80%, the answer is going to be no. 20%, the answer is going to be yes. So if you're a startup who's ever created value for one user, you're past the great filter. You might still fail, but if you do fail, it'll be a really interesting way to fail because 80% of other startups have already failed before getting to that point. Yeah. Say more about what you think are misconceptions people have 
around building MVPs or, or what, what they should launch. You know, there was this sort of, you know, notion and superhuman sort of put the idea in people's minds that they, you know, they should spend two years, you know, heads down, you know, building the perfect thing in, in a competitive space. How do you, how do you sort of see that? Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, so there is, that is kind of justifying, right? So there's these companies that got famous uh, for, like you said, for working hard. And it's like, well, how did they not do a uh, lean MVP? And look, sometimes you're going to get lucky, right? Like sometimes if you do have a good enough idea, you can work on it a long time and you, you still have some shot, right? And there, there's something to it for sure. But I think what people don't realize is when it looks like there's a story like that, when it looks like their, their MVP was two years in the making, a lot of times their real MVP actually came earlier. So for example, like let's take Stripe, right? They do payment processing. Like how do you do an MVP of payment processing? Like you have to write a ton of code to get that to work, right? Well, actually, if, if you look back in time, the MVP of Stripe was they were doing it all manually, right? So they would just have like somebody would email them like, hey, I want to use Stripe. And they would just go and fill out paperwork manually and be like, okay, your account's set up, right? So, so actually surprising little, little code in the first version of Stripe. And people might think that Stripe launched like a year later and that was their MVP. But the actual definition of, of MVP is when was the first value transaction, right? When did the first user get some value out of it? Now, I can't speak for Notion, right? I don't know what the real MVP was, but I've definitely noticed that in almost every case, when people think the MVP was really big, it was actually much smaller. Yeah. No, it's, it, yeah, my, my quick line on that is like, if you are innovating on something that, you know, the, that demand is obvious, like email <laughs> or, you know, uh, note taking, then, you know, you do have to have a, you know, a much better product and, and sometimes you need to get people switch. And sometimes that, that just takes a long time. But for, if you're doing something net new, you know, you're not going to know whether people even want it in the first place. And so to spend two years on it, you know, spend is, you know, is, is, is silly. Right, right. So super, uh, superhuman and hey.com, right? Those actually are like good challenges to the, the whole bloated MVP thesis, which is like, look, if you're replacing an email client, you know, every operation has to be a hundred milliseconds. So how can you possibly launch a, an MVP without a couple years with like a team of 10 working? How are you going to get every operation to a hundred milliseconds? And so I'm sure you can have you know, MVPs of superhuman, and they could just look like this. It could just be like, one of the things I like about superhuman is how I can like quickly archive stuff. And it's just like this, you know, I like that that operation is a hundred milliseconds, just that one operation of like looking at my emails, opening them, archiving them. So even if, even if the actual reply still lived in Gmail, just being able to do that, I personally would probably do that, especially if I worked at superhuman, right? So I, I would at least dog food that, right? I would start using that uh, every day. And I wouldn't, uh, you know, there's some founders who don't even get to the point of dog fooding, actually most founders, right? So I honestly believe that I could start dog fooding superhuman within only like a few weeks of building just that one feature. Yeah, totally. And, and so be, beyond what we've just spoken about, what, what's one or two other things that you want people to take from, from your bloated MVP uh, your series on Medium? Uh, so there's, there's what I call the, the value prop story test. And I, I think people don't realize this. It's a test that just uses pure logic and it can uh, disqualify some ideas like just by using pure logic. So you never even have to get off your couch. Like you never have to build anything, you never have to raise money. You can just sit on your couch and logically think if the idea has any potential whatsoever uh, using the value prop story test. And the way the test works is you just have to get really specific about telling a story of one specific user and how your product gets inserted into their lives, right? And like how they go out of their way to use your product and like exactly how it makes their day better. So it's like a very specific before and after story. Funny enough, there's a lot of companies that I see in the wild who have gotten really far without passing the value prop story test. Like I, if, if you go to my blog, I catalog a number of them where you can see like they've raised millions of dollars. Uh, a lot of them have even launched in public beta, which is kind of funny. I mean, when you have a public beta, that kind of implies having like, you know, dozens of users or whatever. But my whole point is, they don't have one user, like they've never created value for one user. And yet they're like, they're doing all these other steps in what they think is the flowchart uh, of startups. So th they can't tell a single story of like, show me one person who is going out of their way uh, to use your product. And, and you might ask, well, how are they making such an obvious mistake? Like how, you know, why, don't they want to like not fail in an obvious way? The, the thing that's messed up in the human brain that lets so many people not notice that they're not passing the value prop story test is that it's really tempting to just reason in abstractions. So their entire pitch, the entire thing that they're selling to themselves and their employees is entirely abstract. So like I, I have some examples, like there was a, a startup called Alpha Sheets that, that was building like a better spreadsheet. Why? Because it had like fancy formulas um, and it was like legitimately like better software. This, this is a company that uh, eventually they got acquired by Google um, and they didn't get any, any actual market traction, but they built the product over years 
and they made it really good. It was like a really high quality spreadsheet product that could do fancier things. But I, I would always talk to the founders, like I'd check in every few months and I'd be like, hey, have you like nailed down that first use case, right? Are, are you actually getting traction? Are you getting into a user's day? And they're like, well, not yet, but we talked to some people and they said, we need to build this, right? So they kind of repeat the cycle for years. And the sustaining thing that's driving them is like, surely the world needs a better spreadsheet because Excel is, is so messed up, right? So they're stuck on an abstraction. Totally. And I think one of the, you have a number of reviews there. One of them was, was golden. I, I believe you said it was sort of a compelling product, but didn't have a, a great value prop story. Is that, is that right? Yeah, exactly. So Golden's actually a, a company that fundraised recently. So they've raised millions of dollars from Andreessen Horowitz, right? So I, I think that I'm sticking my neck out with this claim, right? Because I'm just directly contradicting Andreessen. Like they obviously think this is a promising startup, whereas I believe that the first line of code should never have been written. Now, obviously the team is very smart. Maybe they know something that I don't know, right? But uh, compare the abstract pitch from Golden with the specific pitch. The abstract pitch sounds amazing, right? What are they doing? They're like a smart knowledge engine, right? Doesn't the world need a knowledge engine? If you look at Wikipedia, it's cool, but it's just a bunch of uh, articles, right? Wikipedia hasn't woken up. It's not intelligent. I wouldn't call Wikipedia a knowledge engine. I need a knowledge engine, right? And like, and you can snipe at Wikipedia. I know they've pointed out like, well, Wikipedia isn't comprehensive, right? There's like, there's some, sometimes they have a political process that doesn't let you post an article, right? So they point out some flaws in Wikipedia and, and they make a, a leap and they say like, well, we need to make a more comprehensive encyclopedia that uses AI to like help write the articles. Um, and, and yeah, and knowledge needs to be better organized. So that's kind of like the abstract vision. It sounds compelling, but then I've just been trying to find, like I'm browsing their website and I'm like, okay, so what's one specific example of like an actual user who just wants to get some knowledge from the knowledge engine? right? And they can't just search Google to get the same knowledge. And the only examples I'm finding are basically just individual articles that they wrote. Like, hey, here's an article about how this company is working on this vaccine and Wikipedia doesn't cover it. And it's like, okay, so you wrote the article. You definitely created value by, by writing the article. I'll give you that. But why couldn't you just like post that on a medium, right? Like where, where did the knowledge engine have value? And I haven't found a, an example yet. Yeah. Disrupting Wikipedia is such a fun uh, startup, startup idea. Uh, how, how else might you uh, even even try to d do it to do it? How else would you disrupt Wikipedia? So I, I do think that that they have a good point that like Wikipedia is too politics heavy, and so you have this experiment. You know, every Wikipedia is basically like Wikipedia with fewer restrictions. So I don't know how successful they are. I think they probably do make some money from SEO, right? They do do some arbitrage, but I don't think that they're wildly successful. I, I think Wikipedia's key advantage is that they've hit some critical mass on getting this community of people. It's like a smaller community than you'd think, right? But it's probably like thousands of people, right? Out of like the billions of readers, there's thousands of people that are like hardcore de dedicated to editing Wikipedia. And so you'd have to you'd have to overcome like a chicken and egg problem to build up those equally passionate thousand people to, to produce content for you instead. Totally. Speaking of, 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 of new ideas, you, you had a post on, on a few different uh, dating app ideas based on your, your, your experience. What um what are some that that are worth mentioning that are interesting? Uh, some dating app ideas. So I think that post was mostly a joke. Like the one was like, you know, you don't want to date somebody with bad breath, so they should have to like uh, mail you a jar of their breath and, you should, uh, <laughs> and see if you're compatible. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. I mean, do you think the future of dating is is, is Tinder, uh, like as in you know incumbents, or will we see new new major players? Yeah, it's a good question. I always get surprised by which uh, social media thing gets gets popular. So I don't feel like I can see the future very well there. I do think that, you know, things are going to be more, they're just going to be better at getting you what you want, right? So Tinder was revolutionary because suddenly you have this big database that everybody's on. And the fact that Tinder was so casual, that's what made like normal people get on it, right? So there, there's like all these people on Tinder who are like the cool kids who would be way too cool to use OkCupid. But Tinder was so casual. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm not really gay. I'm just browsing. I'm just This is just fun for me, right? So they have all this, like, plausible deniability. So then they can enter the marketplace, right? And they can get matched in the database. Um, and I think we're going to see more of that dynamic. But sometimes I get surprised. Like, Bumble came out. And I'm like, Bumble is just another Tinder. And their whole value prop is that they help women by letting the women message first. But in practice, the women just say, hey. So it isn't saying, hey, equivalent to a swipe. So I'm clearly not good at analyzing this because when Bumble came out, I'm like, besides the marketing message that you're from for, for women, you, you have the exact same dynamic. Yeah, totally. Would, the, would you ever match people who are struggling in relationships to each other? Um, yeah, I mean, funny enough, we, uh, we are like poking around at that idea. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's always a big problem of, of like building a big database, right? That's, that's why matchmaking businesses, uh, most of them are, are just like, they're, they're not very, I, I wouldn't recommend using a matchmaker in most cases just because 
it's so their database of clients is so much smaller than a dating apps. And so we don't want to go down that same road. But once we have like sufficiently many clients doing mixers is definitely something to test. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So get, get back to voted MVP for a second. H- how does blockchain fit into fit into that narrative? And, and what about uh, DeFi as well? Yeah, sure. So uh, blockchain, it, it, it's a candidate. I'm starting to suspect that blockchain might be the ultimate bloated MVP. So that's, that's the connection there. And it's it's funny coming for me because I was actually pretty early to Bitcoin. I was buying Bitcoin in 2011, uh, angel investing in Coinbase. So back in the day, I, I, and I still am pretty bullish on Bitcoin. Like, you know, I think everybody should have a little Bitcoin in their portfolio. But I think that blockchain at large, like remember in 2017 and in, in the, the ICO craze, everybody's like, it's not about Bitcoin, it's about blockchain, right? And, and they're pitching all these white papers, all these different protocols. Um, and a lot of that has gone out of the mainstream, right? Like it's people have more consolidated on like Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, and, you know, like dApps, right? I don't know anybody who's using a dApp. So I started to suspect like, is blockchain, you know, blockchain is not just like, okay, you got Andreessen to give you a few million dollars. Blockchain is like, you got, you know, millions of people to give you billions of dollars, right? The ultimate bloated MVP. And I started looking at all these projects and I do think that the vast majority are bloated MVPs. Uh, but the vast majority of startups are already bloated MVPs. So like instead of 80% being bloated MVPs, it's like 90% bloated MVPs. So I did a bunch of digging and uh, I, I did manage to find a couple that I actually think are pretty interesting. So for example, uh, Augur, you know, the prediction market, one of the things that they're actually doing that's interesting with blockchain, uh, the settlement of how the prediction turned out, right? So like, let's say um, you, let's say you think that like, uh, you know, somebody is going to hit a home run and it's, I, I don't know how a home run can be ambiguous, right? But maybe, maybe it was kind of like on the foul line or whatever, right? So the crowd can settle whether or not it legitimately counts as a home run. That sounds like a contrived example, but look at what happened in November, right? Like we had some prediction markets took a while to settle uh, whether uh, Biden actually won the election or not. So, so the crowd has a consensus protocol using their stake in, in, in the Augur blockchain. Of, you know, they basically vote and they give up reputation if they end up disagreeing with the crowd. So that is legitimately an interesting blockchain protocol. So I got a hand to them and, and I hope that they succeed. Now, most of the other use cases I look like uh, that I looked at are very dubious and potentially bloated MVPs. For example, uh, Filecoin, you know, it sounds great, right? On the abstract level, it sounds great, right? It's like everybody stores files together by reputation. You don't have to centralize your file storage. Um, but it's pretty hard to imagine that file storage is an actual pain point, right? Like, you know, if you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin helps the unbanked, right? But is, there's not really an unstoraged, right? Like, is there anybody who's really hard up for storage right now on the internet at significant scale and, and, and can't get a little money from like AdSense or community donations to fund a little bit of storage? Um, like, I'm just, I'm pretty skeptical that anybody needs peer-to-peer storage. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Going forward uh, within crypto or blockchain, where are you most excited? Uh, let's see. So I'm, I'm excited in the few applications that actually seem to, to have coherent use cases. Like, it, so it's weird to me, like most of the blockchain use cases, oh, most, they seem to be falling into the hole of like, you know, they're not really blockchain, they're just Bitcoin. And the only thing that's good about them is that you can transact in payments easily, which is like, yeah, right. That's what Bitcoin lets you do, transact in payments easily. And like this other blockchain company, they're just benefiting from the fact that payments are easy. Like they're not doing anything uh, extra special. So where I am bullish though, you know, DeFi in theory sounds great, right? Because like the financial system is, is like so old, right? In the US and like, it, it's so annoying to use. So, and, and for example, just like putting money in savings and getting a reasonable interest rate, right? Like how can I put money in savings right now? But instead of earning like 0.1%, uh, earn like 4%, right? Like, is there any way to do that? And DeFi promises that there will be, but the problem is you're taking on some risk of some trust of somewhere else in the chain. So like, could we theoretically do that? Like, could you put put Bitcoin somewhere and have a smart contract where your Bitcoin gives you back more Bitcoin? Like, theoretically, that makes perfect sense. But I'm just, I haven't seen the architecture of how that could possibly work, if ever. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I, I want to zoom out and talk about a, a different po- topic as we headed towards close here, which is the the rationality community. Because my understanding is that you, you've been per- involved or peripherally involved. And, I'm, you know, less wrong with such an interesting intellectual movement and I, I guess I'm curious how you see that, how that community has evolved and where is sort of the, the rationality movement or community today and what has, um, what is it splintered into? And, you know, uh, and separately, like, what is the, what is the less wrong equivalent today? Like, where are the interesting uh, intellectual w- movements? So those are a few questions, but why don't you uh, expound a bit? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you asked because I always think that the rationality community should just get more exposure, uh, because I, I feel like they're still, they're steadily getting more, but, uh, people don't really know about them. So here's my chance to do a little uh, publicizing. So the rationality community, 
there it's kind of like all those books you read, you know, all those popular books that say like, oh, we're so biased. Our brain is so messed up. Humans are such fallible creatures. They kind of start there and then they're like, OK, but how do you fix it? Right. Like, how do you take your brain and just like make it think as well as possible, given the limitations you have? Right. They take the next step. Um, and the reason they're so interested in that, one big reason is because they also want to do that with AI. Right. Like they, they want to have some pathway that when you have to type code into a computer and then it starts thinking on its own, like you really want to make sure you've programmed the right stuff and you haven't just like, you know, used your own biases and made like magnified versions of those in the AI. Because then there's the whole AI risk factor of like, you know, you might not get a, a chance to, you might not get a do over if you don't get it right the first time. So the stakes are kind of high to really understand how to think properly. Totally. How should we think about the rationality and, and post ration, uh, post rat community? Um, well, I haven't really dug into post rat and, and I think that we should just focus on regular rationality. Like, I don't think we're ready to move to post rat yet. Um, just because like, I think that the, the, the bread and butter of regular rationality is just starting to seep into the mainstream. So like, you know, the idea of Bayesian probability or just like probability weighted judgments or expected value, it's it's slowly becoming more and more common to be like, okay, give me a probability estimate, right? And there's like a famous example, like that book, Super Forecasters by Philip Tetlock. That's a big rationality community book. And it's slowly seeping into the mainstream a little bit more every year. Um, for example, like if you would read, the book points out that like, you know, when the when they're talking about like Iraq and weapons of mass destruction, they, w- they would just use words in their reports to, to the president, like the intelligence reports, they'd be like, quite likely or like significant chance. And they use these like vague uh, English words. And then later it turned out that like, you know, those words, they could mean anything from like 10% to 90%, right? And so they were like, they were, they were sacrificing their ability to communicate about belief states. And it turns out that that's a really useful concept. And today it's just so much more common to be like, can you give me odds? Can you give me an expected value calculation? And it turns out that like using your brain to get a little more precise like that um, is totally worth it. And it's like a good skill to develop. Uh, you know, to try to get things down to like as tight of a probability range as you can. And, you know, famously his super forecasters, they're a group of people that just consistently predict stuff really well. It's kind of like in Minority Report, right? Like those predictors, except it's like actual people who exist, right? And they're just really good at the mental habits that make you good at predicting the future, right? So for example, like they, they, they don't even need to be an expert on the topic. They just have to like pay attention to like the statistics, you know, the baseline statistics, and then go and do a little research and make a few adjustments. And they'll do better than like an expert that has like a theory that they're attached to. You know, they have the skill of prediction. Yeah. So if, if we're, you know, reflecting back, you know, 30 years from now on sort of the, the biggest contribution that the rationality community has has created, uh, what would you say it is to intellectual culture at large? Uh, let's see. So you could really go down the list of greatest hits and probably each of those has made like it's made its own wave. So definitely, yeah, I got a hit on the stuff I just said, you know, the super forecasting, the probability estimates, expected value. That's a huge one. And then another one is kind of like cataloging biases and making those mainstream. So like, you know, anchoring bias, right? It's becoming more mainstream. The idea that like, hey, if I just if the first thing I tell you is, is some estimate, you know, some ran, random estimate, like, hey, how many um, Jew- Jewish people live in the United States? Do you think it's greater than or less than 5 million? You're, I'm going to get a very different answer from you uh, if I then ask you to estimate compared to if I said, hey, do you think it's greater than or less than 100,000, right? Whatever answer you give me is suddenly going to be very modified by just the random number that I chose to tell you in the question I asked. So uh, there has been a fascinating conversation um, for people who want to learn more uh, you know, about Relationship Hero, about Bloated MVP, about you know, the rationality community and, and some of the thoughts we were just talking about. Where can you point them? Uh, yeah, so go to um, relationshiphero.com slash VS. It's a special code for Venture Stories. It'll give you $50 off. Uh, or uh, just check check me out on Twitter. It's just my name, uh, Liron, L-I-R-O-N. Awesome. I highly recommend do, doing both of those things. Uh, Liron, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a great episode. Thanks, Eric. I enjoyed it. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.